If you don't believe in yourself, how can you believe in anybody else? So you need to work on that first and not by phony stuff, just, oh, you're wonderful and stuff. No, you're a bum. <laughs> you're, you're a louse. You're, you're doing bad things. So shape up. You seem like a person who, who goes to first principles, uh, to, to use that expression. And I had Thomas Ricks on the, on the podcast, The Historian, not long ago. But, but the idea of, of sort of getting to the root of whatever you think, I've got to imagine part of the reason you wrote the book was just to, not, not just to teach other people, but there's something about writing that forces you to examine what you think and why you think it. And, and is, that, is that sort of why you did the book? No, no, it was uh, no, and I, I I'll get into this if you, if you, if sure. it's interesting is that I I discovered uh, my gift at a very early age, and uh, but then I didn't know what to do with it, and I struggled with how to develop it and apply it in a way I could believe in myself for like twenty years, and even when I was successful. I felt empty and, and lost. And finally, I said, I've got to go find some principles that can guide me. And so I've, so I've been like a crazed man on finding and applying principles ever since. And that was, I, I, I discovered my gift age seven. So it's starting at 27. I, ever since, I've been guided by finding principles. And in today, principles we've had, just had a meeting with one of our business units, how now they're even applying it better and getting more innovations and empowering our people. And I mean, it's so exciting. At 85, stuff I've been working on 60 years is, is just blossoming. Chase, I was going to ask you, th these are probably ideas you have heard over and over again through your life. Is it weird to see them on the page how, how, when you, it, 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 you must have a strange relationship with it because it's their ideas that I imagine you have uh, uh, a certain amount of agreement <laughs> with, but then also when they're coming from your dad, it, you, yeah. you probably uh, see them differently. No, I mean, I think we probably all have interesting perspectives here and just hearing his story and th getting to know you um, and your story as well. You know, when you started in business, you know, working with American Apparel and, you know, becoming this kind of marketing rock star and the whole thing, like at some point, like my understanding of your story is like you kind of said, hey, it's all about these ideas mm -hmm. and it's about these principles and you're going to go all in on that and dedicate your life to helping make stoicism actionable so people could improve their lives. So it was, what's so cool about you two kind of having this conversation is I see a, like a lot of similarities. It's almost uncanny. Um, but yeah, but with, I guess, with my relationship uh, with these principles, um, I, you know, at, at the age of four or five years old, I had no choice. Right? <laughs> I mean, it was kind of like, um, you know, I remember at the dinner table, uh, my sister and I, we had our five principles growing up were love, courage, faith, honor, and loyalty. And so like, you know, as a kid, you gotta break it down and make them really simple. We weren't quite to stoicism at that level, right? <laughs> but we had to, um, every single night uh, that we'd start dinner with, all right, tell me one principle and how did you exemplify that over the course of your day? So that's kind of how it all started and then, nine, 10, 11 years old, we'd be in his library on Sunday afternoons and we'd be listening to books on tape from Milton Friedman <laughs> and uh, Hayek. And like, are you kidding me at age 10, 11? Like, don't, really? don't forget Aristotle. Yeah, Chase. Aristotle as well. So, but, but yeah, and then over the course of my life, obviously, you know, uh, you start to learn the importance of the principles and how to apply them. So, you know, when you have them, you're exposed to them as a kid, it all starts to make sense. But yeah, there's a there's a Plutarch line where he talks about, you know, you learn the words and then you have experiences that bring meaning to the words. I've got to imagine you both, you, you know, this is sort of what you think. And then you see these ideas play out in the business world or your personal life. So you learn them at 10, but then it's 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 a it's a totally different thing to actually see, oh, you know, dad wasn't just making this up. And then Charles for you, like, oh, Aristotle actually knew what he was talking about two thousand years right. ago. 
One swallow does not make a spring. I'll never forget that one. But that is, there's a lot more power in that than most people take it at first glance as there is in, in all of these. Uh, but I mean, it's what, what you said is uh, Michael Polanyi, philosopher of science, captured this book in his personal knowledge. He said, he said uh, it, uh, a lot of us have conceptual knowledge. We have concepts in mind, but it's entirely different to make these concepts an extension of yourself. And he, he used uh, someone who becomes a concert violinist. Okay, the, and the way you get there is by understanding the parts conceptually and, and applying them. And for example, first thing she had to do is learn how to hold it and then how to make certain notes and then do it in a certain way and then when you when when all those parts become natural and instinctive then you can focus on the whole on making beautiful music and that's what we find for our our management approach and everything for our guiding principles and our five dimensions when they all work in harmony in a reinforcing way there is the power it's and, it's, and I and saying when we first started this, I was teaching concepts that okay, everybody get the now go do it, and nothing happened except people you use it as buzzwords. And then finally, when I read Polanyi, okay, no, no, we we've got to find a way to make it personal knowledge. So rather than just teach the concepts, we would help people mentor them, show them how to apply it, and show by example. Here's. And then, and then I have to be the example. Okay, every every meeting. Okay, how are we applying this? And are you applying it this way and that way? And then after a while, now all our leaders and everybody does this instinctively. It's become personal knowledge. Yeah, I think like writing or playing the violin or you know uh, being a woodworker or something. We we understand sort of that that obviously is a craft. And there's a certain skill to it and there's there's certain things you do. What I get, you know, studying your company and 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 reading uh, your books is this sense that you sort of applied that mindset, you know, the, the idea of being a, a master violinist to managing people. And it, it must be something extraordinary to manage. I mean, how, how many people work for the Coke companies? Like 100,000, 150,000, something like that? Yeah, 130,000 roughly. So, yeah, so the instrument you're playing is hundred, you know, enough people to fill, you know, a college football stadium that, that, you know, each one being an expert in something that they do, that must be an extraordinary feeling, but it also must be extraordinarily uh, difficult. If you're like me, you grew up eating the sugariest, most unhealthy cereal you could possibly imagine. You can't even wrap your head around how your parents allowed you to do this. And now that you're older, you want to eat healthier, you want your kids to eat healthy, but you still love the delicious taste of cereal. That's what I love about Magic Spoon. It's high protein, keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, wheat free, totally delicious. I just absolutely love it. 13 grams of protein, only five net carbs, zero grams of sugar. It's just the best cereal. I don't eat cereal in the morning most times, but I do have it for dessert a lot of days. Just absolutely great. We pick these wild blackberries on our farm. I ate that in there, but check it out. I think there's free shipping with your order. You can use code Ryan Holiday. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video and this podcast. Seriously, it's legit delicious. But it's but it's so satisfying, and and it as you can know, it's not instant pudding. It doesn't happen automatically. Right. So everything we do is guided by these principles that, I mean, they start with, okay, how do, how are we going to be successful long-term? And it's, and, and, okay, it's by understanding how, what capabilities we have as an organization that will create value for others. And of course, our customers, but but fellow employees, coworkers, but our suppliers, our communities, and society as a whole. And why? Because all of these groups are important to our success. And if we aren't if we aren't helping them succeed, they won't want us around. 
they certainly won't, <laughs> our customers won't pay us anything and employees won't be dedicated. It'll be like the old Soviet Union where they would say, uh, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. And so what we have now, because because we we work at this and we 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 recruit people who are contribution motivated and have some talent, uh, some particular gift that can help us create value, and then get them in a role that fits that rather than just stick them in a role that doesn't fit their gift and and passion, and then give them the tools and then reward them for it. At every level. And Ryan, I think um, on this idea that, that he's hitting on, one of the most important things that I've learned in like how Coke Industries has been built, not only what he's talking about and having the vision and think about it from a capability-based mindset and then where can we capture opportunities based on our capabilities, it's this idea of focus on your gift. And this is, this is the highlighted in the book as well, like believing in people and understanding that every single person has a gift. Well, using him as an example, as C, he's an atypical uh, CEO. And the reason I say that is that he doesn't call himself CEO, he calls himself chief philosophy officer. Because his comparative advantage is, you know, put the philosophy out there, come up with new ideas. And then if you can get those ideas across the 130,000 employees, they take, you empower those people with ideas and they run with it and they innovate it. They innovate around those ideas in their own way versus a top down approach where here's how you do it. Here's the book. And that's how you grow a company. There's no way in, in today's day and age with technology moving so fast, you can have a top down approach. And so his role is, is very uh, a good example of how we try to do that within the firm and, and how we believe that it, you know, works in society to unlock people's potential as well. So I, I love the idea of being a chief philosophy officer, obviously. What, 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 what does that actually look like day to day? I mean, I imagine your role has shifted over time, but you know, we have this idea of the, the philosopher being someone who just maybe writes books or reads books, but how, how do you how do you come up with and continue to study and engage with the philosophy that that's sort of your job to come up with? Well, but I, I constantly read and, and look for, uh, for new principles and then how to better apply these principles. And I mean, just like reading your material, okay, what, what ideas can I get for that on how we can more effectively uh, apply them? And then, and then every engagement I have, with uh, with one of our businesses or capabilities, uh, I I ask him questions about okay how are you applying this, what innovations are you get, are how are how are your supervisors uh, at every level, are they is their primary uh, goal to empower their people, to help their people self-actualize so we get the full benefit of their knowledge, ability, and ideas uh, and, and have them turned on so it's mutually beneficial and rewarding or not. But and then, another, another practical way that, that he, he does this is he has two direct reports. Wow. So if you want to be chief philosophy officer, right, and, and focus on ideas and, and carve out time to think, as opposed to being in meetings all day, like a lot of CEOs you look at, that's what they've got, you know, 10 direct reports. He organized his life and the structure of the organization so that he can spend the time on where he has the, the strongest gift. And so if you can apply that 130,000 times over and really get that right, that's, that's a very powerful model. I imagine that takes a lot of discipline, right? There's probably a lot of things you would like to be involved with or things, given that you're, you seem very exacting and have high standards, there's probably things you'd like to get in there and micromanage. It probably takes discipline to be the owner or the head of a company and only have two people reporting to you. No, but see, I, I mean, what drives me and, and what caused me to, to be lost for 20 years after, after I, I discovered my particular gift uh, was that I am contribution motivated. 
unless I feel I'm contributing to the to the greatest, or as Maslow said, unless I'm realizing my potential, as he said, if you're not realizing your potential and developing your capability, you will be deeply unhappy no matter how successful you appear to be. And that's where I was. So once I got these principles, started finding these principles and finding out when I applied them properly and help people apply them, the power was so much greater than me going doing it itself, uh, than, than myself, that that's what I want to do. So I tell our people, bring me in a meeting if you think I can help. If you don't, don't waste my time and yours. Because I'll come in there and start asking, and if it's not going to help, don't invite me. And so they're very good about that because they know where I can help, where I can't. Yeah, I mean, I, I break it down to getting out of the way where you don't have a comparative advantage and empowering others to do that, right? It seems like a, a simple concept, but hard to apply in, in reality. There's a, there's a story from Marcus Aurelius that I think you'd both would love. He, he's, he's an old man at this point, and he's, you know, the emperor, the most powerful man in the world. And he's seen leaving the palace, and one of his friends is walking by, and he says, you know, Marcus, where are you going? And he says, I'm, I'm off to see Sextus the philosopher to learn that which I don't yet know. And, and his friend sort of marvels the quote that survives to us. He says, here, here is an old man still taking up his tablets and going to school. You, you seem remarkably curious, like you're always, you're continuing, even though you're rating mostly old ideas, you're always looking for something new. How do you, how do you stay intellectually curious? I imagine you've read thousands of books, you've seen it all. How do you stay curious? But see, I haven't seen it all. I mean, the amount of knowledge and wisdom and, and experiences out there are almost infinite. And so there's always more to learn. I mean, and that's what, I mean, that's why uh, humility is one of our principles. And, the, and the, so the key, uh, as I said, the a, a key is find your gift, develop it and apply it in a way that enables you to see by helping others succeed. Now, but the other uh, aspect of that is when you learn your gift, then you should also learn what you're not good at. Right. And so in my life, what I have learned the hard way is when I try to do everything myself and micromanage, I'm trying to do a lot of things I'm not that good at. And so I failed. And I don't like to fail that much. So I now I've learned to partner on everything and on your, your, your thing on being negative Whenever I have an idea, I think, okay, who can, uh, uh, following Popper's uh, science as falsification, okay, I look at it, I have, uh, I have a, a testable hypothesis, and I want you to come and show me the flaws in it, to prove it wrong, or, or better yet, show the flaws and correct it so it can be successful. Now, why everybody doesn't do this it's mystery to me because, okay, your little ego is going to be damaged. Somebody hurt a little bit. But if you go plunge out in something that has basic flaws and have this big disaster, how's your little ego going to feel then? And I, so I've never understood why. What do you just want to fail? <laughs> Well, it's, it's tough, right? Because, you know, you only have so much time. Like, so, so most people are like, let's say, struggling to read, right? To make time to read. So then they make time to read. This is something I think about, especially with, with young kids. You, you make time to read. And then you're like, wait, I'm going to read something that I don't agree with. I'm going to read something that makes me angry. I'm going to read something that, that challenges the assumptions I've built my life around. That's a, that's a hard thing for people to, to, to justify, I think. No, but I, that's what I did. I mean, I read, uh, I read, uh, I read Marx. I read Keynes. I read Mao. I read Lenin. I read all these people who were totally top down, the opposite of of what we try to do, bottom up empowerment. People who had the, what Nietzsche called the will to power, and were obsessed with getting power, and because they were successful. 
Now, so we can learn something from them. That doesn't mean we want to do it the way they did it, but what made them successful? And so I've learned from all these, as, as you, you may have noticed my book, I quote, I quote Marx, who said, the philosophers only interpret the world. The point is to change it. So that's, he's right. So you can't just be a philosopher who philosophizes. You've got to go apply it. You've got to, or as Lenin said, we learn through struggle. So Which is exactly tied into obstacles the way. Well, I was going to say, Chase, uh, sort of rubber meeting the road, how, uh, how much does your dad enjoy being uh, disagreed with or challenged? And, and how has that gone throughout your relationship? You know, I, I, I'll give him a lot of credit um, in that. Well, I'll, for, I'll, I'll start with the story. Um, I guess uh, when, I, when I was a kid in my, my, first, um, my first role at Coke Industries, so I, I can't remember if I told you this or not, but I, I grew up a pretty competitive tennis player. I was nationally ranked. And um, by the time I was 15 years old, I just got burned out. It was one of those things I was playing five, six hours a day, and I just wasn't into it anymore. And um, I remember my mother coming back to my father and saying, look, this kid's going off the rails. He's not trying anymore. He's throwing matches in intentionally. What's going on? And um, so he pulled me aside and said, you can either – give 100% on the tennis court and give it your all because you have a gift there or I'm going to get you a job. And I immediately said, I want a job. I am so sick of this sport. Like I, I just can't take it anymore. So I thought I was going to be like folding clothes at a, at a clothing store here in Wichita and still hanging out with my friends. The next morning I was in an old beater pickup truck on the way to Syracuse, Kansas. Six hours later, I show up with 60,000 of my new best friends and they were all cattle. <laughs> so, you know, like I went from playing tennis to, um, you know, shoveling cow shit for 60,000 of my new best friends. And but that so so there wasn't much of a challenge process there right. <laughs> um, with my dad. But I look back on. No, that. I gave you a choice. Yeah, you didn't give me a choice. <laughs> but I look Turn back on that. Our- on that experience sure. and like this whole idea, this goes back to kind of the, the key principle of the book and believing in people and how do you help people find their gifts so that they can unlock their potential. Ironically, that first job that I had was the first opportunity I had to believe in myself. And it's strange that it takes a job like that to do it. But I was like, I was working with people of diverse backgrounds and learned like how to work with people as a team and all that. First time I learned the value of a dollar, it was the first time I felt good about myself. Right. So then I wanted that feeling over and over and over again. And um, it also helped me discover a gift that I still use today in terms of like what I do in business is I go originate. I build relationships to get access to technology and companies that we can help. And uh, I started learning that at the feed yard at age 15. Right. So um, anyway, it's, it's just I think it's one of the core principles is how do you discover your gift as early as possible in life and experiment a lot of different things to do that. Yeah, it's like, I, so I, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. No, I, I, so I mean that in in our relationship, or my relationship with anybody here, I'm not telling them what to do, That's right. but I question them and I challenge them. And then I, as a supervisor at, at, a, at a certain level, as we expect all our supervisors for their people to challenge them. And if they don't do it and we can't get them to to get their people to challenge them, then they shouldn't be a supervisor because they're not using the knowledge of the people. And so, so, I mean, Chase has done things that I couldn't have done, like I couldn't have gone and built Coke Disruptive Technologies in just a few years and have, what, over 20 great investments now, by building these relationships and using networking through Coke Industries to, to help uh, tech entrepreneurs be more successful, and so we can perform, become the preferred investor with them. I mean, I couldn't have done that because I didn't have his abilities. He has different abilities than I. So I learned from him, and I learned from our daughter who has still different capabilities. So that's why when we get together, we have fun. We learn from each other and we laugh a lot and insult each other in a loving way. And 
and it's great fun. I think part of it, Ryan, is uh, is starting with an open mindset. Um, and I think that's if you look at what's happening in our country today with just the divisiveness that's been built up over time. Um, I think we all recognize that openness is the starting point to actually bring people together. Whether, whether they, you know, disagree on things or not, that's how you get things done. And uh, Elizabeth, my sister, has really helped us. She even has an organization called Unlikely Collaborators that does nothing but this. Like, do your internal work first before you, like, think about the external work. Because if you can't be open yourself to, to new ideas, back to this idea of the scientific method, then you really have no chance, right, of, of figuring out how to, to reach across um, divides and, um, and make things happen. Yeah, it's very much what, what you teach. I mean, the, the only person you can really control is yourself, so you better start with that. And that's, what, that's her whole effort is, is, is based on that approach. Well, let's talk about, about uh, some challenges to assumptions. I, I generally agree with the premise of the book, right, which is that, that bottom up is better than top down and that uh, sort of central planning tends to fall short. Uh, and, and when you give people the tools, the incentives and, and, and the freedom, they, they, they sort of come together and do the right thing. Um, I'm talking to you from Florida, not from Texas because uh, no power, no water. We just went through this insane sort of freak storm and then uh, sort of electricity and water crisis. How, how do you feel, how do you feel some of these uh, sort of top up, or sorry, bottom up uh, methodologies, how, how do you feel like they've weathered the last 12 months with the pandemic, with, with, uh, with, with some of the things we're seeing in the world? How, how do you, how do you see something like what happened in Texas and, and, and sort of the market failures there and, and, and where does that work with your, with your worldview? Well, uh, I mean, let's go to the, the pandemic. Uh, first, uh, what, uh, I mean, I mean, the, 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 the role of the government, the, the primary role is, is to, to, to me, is to protect equal rights, to establish a system of equal rights, and, and to have a system that prevents people from violating the rights of others. And, and, and so this would be to be uh, secure. So if somebody's got a, a, a disease and running around infecting people, right? Yeah, that needs to be to, to use force to pre prevent prevent that if you can't prevent it by voluntary means, and uh, and so uh, on the pandemic. So the the question is, what should the government role? Well, it should be to uh, to set standards. But generalized standards, not details one, because every, every situation is different. So what we do here at, at Coke Industries, throughout Coke Industries, we set the general standards like spacing. Don't come to work if, if you feel uncomfortable. Don't come to work if you've been sick. Uh, get tested. Uh, we encourage you to get vaccinated. Uh, and, and then, uh, Within that, within those general standards, then each location encourages their people to innovate, to practice that, rather than we describe, uh, prescribe in detail how to do it. And so we have one of the better uh, records on operation through this uh, than 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 our competitors. No, and so 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 it's yeah. So when when we say bottom up. What we mean, those who are closest to the problem should decide that, who have the best knowledge. And, if, and, and so big on how, how disease spreads would be established by, us, by scientists. Now, a lot of these top down, though, had nothing to do with it. Like you can go along the beach, but you can't swim in the ocean. <laughs> what are you afraid? The sharks have it? I mean, this is ridiculous. Or let's stick all the people with COVID who are, who are old into, into nursing homes. Sure. I mean, some of these things are, are crazy. So, 
So you got to be careful on top down, one size fits all, because if you're wrong, you have a disaster. Where if one local does it, then you can cure it. No, that makes sense. I, I think uh, I, I, I totally I, I agree with the idea that, that the role of government is is to protect equal rights. I guess I would also say that the role of government or in a business as well um, is to solve collective action problems. And so it, it strikes me that, you know, whether we're talking about climate change or whether we're talking about racial injustice or whether we're talking about a pandemic or in Texas's case, a power grid failure, what, what we have are sort of these large collective action problems. And it's, it's, it, it feels like both sides, whether it's the sort of free market approach or the top down approach, um, is falling short as far as solving these difficult collective action problems because it's it's not quite anyone's problem, and on the other hand, not quite anyone has the authority or the power to do what obviously needs to be done. Well, see, see, we would we would agree that what we look at uh, at society as made up of of four sets of key four key sets of institutions, uh, communities education, business, and government. And they all have a role. Sure. But we, but we would say that the role on each of them would be to, 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 uh, to practice their art and their comparative advantage in a way that empowers people to want to do it rather than force them to do it. Because when, when it's based on force, and, and sometimes you've got to use force. If you've got go, somebody going around shooting people, you've got to stop them and get them out of circulation. But at the same time, if you have every, as we had in this country for a number of years, anybody who makes a mistake, let's, let's put them in prison and leave them there forever. Sure. And then that, that doesn't work either. And so you're right, we need a combination, but what we try to do is encourage all the institutions to help people to set up rules and practices that help people find their gift, turn it into valued skills, and then practice it in a way that they succeed by helping others succeed. And you find societies through history that best did that are the ones that that, well, changed the world starting about 1800. It seems like maybe Operation Warp Speed is a good example of, of that hybrid approach where you have the sort of the government or the central planners setting some incentives, setting some guidelines, eliminating some obstacles. And then there's the hybrid of the business community coming in the, and, and, and then the scientists creating something that's never been created and a timeline that's never been done with, with the, the, the sort of the things that might have ordinarily held them back, worried who's going to buy them, you know, the, the risk of experimenting with this new vaccine. Um, so it works there. And then the rollout, which, you know, does require a certain amount of uh, central planning and logistics seems to have floundered for the exact opposite reason. Yeah, I, I think uh, Hayek put it in that, as you know, I like abstractions. And his, his was that, uh, that what he called probably the greatest discovery in the history of mankind was that people, the discovery that people could live in peace, live in peace and to their mutual advantage when limited only by abstract rules of conduct. So then that's, that's the role of government, but it's also the role of a culture. Right. Because if you have a culture, as John Adams said, th this is a system for moral people that will work for no other. If you have people who aren't gonna uh, obey it and are gonna be circularly trying to murder each other, you can set up all the rules you want, and you can have police on every corner, as, as I saw years ago when I was in Argentina, and they were having their, their civil war. I mean, people are gonna kill each other. So the culture, it starts with culture. And, and to me, politics and, and political system is derivative of that. So that's the main thing we have to work on. How do we get that? So. So we want to succeed by helping others succeed. And we realize that that's the best way to succeed. 
I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, there's this sort of stoic idea that just because you can do something, just because it's legally allowed, just because you can get away with it, doesn't mean that you should. That's this sort of virtue of temperance or moderation or self-discipline. Absolutely. It, it strikes me that culturally we're, we're sort of reaping the whirlwind of, it's like you and I know what the norms are. We know what the rules are. We know what the abstract, abstract principles are because we've studied them. We've read about them. We, we, we fell in love with them through our books. And I think we're struggling when you have a culture where, where people haven't been taught these ideas. They don't know uh, uh, any of these thinkers. They don't understand why the system is set up the way that it was set up. And then so, so we see these, not only do we see bad actors sort of overriding the norms, whether they're on the left or the right, um, we see uh, the public not able to fully understand why this particular norm is important. And then we're not able to enforce it politically or culturally. And we're really not able to enforce it legally. And we, we kind of just watch the system crumble in front of us. No, that's right. No, this is I mean, that's what we say. What in the book? What we're after is showing there's a better way than this divisiveness. And and you're either in my tribe or the other, and we're going to try to hurt your tribe or, or you hurt us, and we have violence on both sides. And, I mean, this is so, this is scary. And then, and then what, what happens when we see that is the appeal of a strong man. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or a strong woman, but it's yeah. usually the bad guy's usually a strong man, and they give all power to them because you got to stop the other side who's going to be worse. Sure. And the other side, no, you're going to their side's going to be worse. So we need to be strong, and we need to shut you down. And that's just then that escalates, and then you have a civil war or hatred or or destruction of society. And we've seen that happen throughout history. And that's scary. That's the direction we're going. So we're being attacked by both sides, by right and left uh, daily now. And so it shows uh, maybe we're on the right track here. Well, I'd be curious, and, and this is a question for both of you, th this idea that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. It must be strange to become successful at a level where essentially anything that a person can do, you are able to do, right? How, how, does, how does one have that sense of, uh, whether it's as a parent or a business person or just a, you know, a human being, how do, you, how do you manage that idea? Well, like I could buy this, I could uh, uh, go on, uh, I could get away with this, I could just have the lawyers take care of that, but I'm not gonna do it because it's not right, it's not good for me. You know, how, do you, how do you manage that idea of I can, but I'm not going to because I don't think it's the right thing to do? Well, what I've learned yeah. since I was a, a kid is go back to first principles. If you have a framework for what principles are most important and what your own personal North Star is, which ties to your gift, right? Uh, what am I gonna focus on? Because you have all these resources, what am I gonna choose? And is it the right uh, decision? Does it add value to society? Does it harm society or whatever? That, that's, um, I guess that's the way I've grown up. And it, but without principles, you fall into the trap that I think what you're talking about, right? And you could go down um, you know, the wrong path and do, do harm with, with resources. And you, you, you see that time and time again. But I think it, it, the way I'd answer your question is you have to start with a framework of core principles and then your own personal North Star of where you're going and then say no to everything else that doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into that. And then, and so for, for me, I mean, I, I agree exactly what, what Jay said is that, is that when I got into these principles and my North Star became uh, working toward, working for a society based on equal rights and mutual benefit where everybody had the opportunity to realize their potential. And so I needed to behave in that way. I needed to, we needed to, to run our company that way. We need to focus on how do we create value for others? How do we empower our employees? How do we make it, it good for them and reward them so they have a fulfilling life? And then how do we get that to spread? So people see, okay, we've become very successful by doing this. 
So you, rather than short term, try to get subsidies or try to hurt your competitors or, or keep out competitors or stop innovation that's going to hurt you or, or put you out of business, to you innovate. You do a better job of empowering your employees. And, and then we win. And look, if everybody were focused on empowering their employees and the employees became self-actualized and wanted to succeed by helping others, what would that do to the culture? We find, we find our employees who, who no longer here, they don't owe me anything anymore. They call me. Some, one just called me this week who had been, he said he had to tell me what it's done for his life, not just in business, but it's changed the way he deals with his church or, or his synagogue or, or whatever, and his charity, his dealings with his family and everything by living by these principles. So it is so powerful, and we just need to get, get that out. And that's what we're trying to do in the book is get this out. This will make your life better, and you will feel so much better about yourself. Hey, Brian, what, one example of this is a, a key kind of mental model or principle that we use on who do you partner with? I think this goes back to, back to your question, whether it's in business or whether it's um, on the philanthropic side as well. We want to make sure that we have uh, partnerships where there's one aligned vision in terms of where you want to go what, and what the, what's the potential of that. Two, aligned values, which we've been talking about here. And then three, complementary capabilities. So I'll use one example, um, and this is in the book, um, about uh, a, a gentleman that we've partnered with to really empower him from the bottom up. And it's around this key issue that we have a lot of focus on around overcoming addiction. And so I don't know if, if you read this, but Scott Strode is really the story. And he created an organization called The Phoenix. And uh, Scott, Scott's quick story is, you know, he battled, um, battled addiction uh, for many years. And what he found that got him kind of over the hump and start to break through the problem was exercise. He get on his bike and that was like what, what made him alive again. And so with that idea, what worked for him he said, okay, what if I can create a gym that has a community effect of everyone else that's going through the same problem that I can scale up the, the solution that I created myself and do that in a gym and combine the power of exercise with uh, the power of community and let's see what happens, right? And so he created two or three of these gyms and the results that he got were um, something like 80% um, of the folks didn't have any relapse within the first three months, which is just mind boggling results, right? It's an order of magnitude better than, than some of the best programs in the country. And so, so in terms of, okay, what do you focus on? What do you don't? We want to go partner with Scott because he has a, a very innovative approach that gets real results from the bottom up that we can help scale with capital and capability. So just within the last couple of years, he's gone from three locations to almost 60. And now he's using virtual with, you know, COVID, this massive discovery that people in France and the UK that are tapping into this now. So it's like a global solution that, that we believe if we keep going with this can create a movement around overcoming addiction. So in terms of choices like we make and what we focus on, those are the partnerships that we want to have. No, that's fascinating. The, the idea of finding something that's working and then putting more, you know, more fuel behind that as opposed to trying to think that maybe this goes to your point about ego, Charles, of like, I'm a genius. I'm going to come up with yeah, okay. the perfect solution to this problem. And then I'm going to, I'm going to throw my resources and money behind it until it works. And that's probably, you know, the logic behind most philanthropic endeavors is mm -hmm. I've solved this problem and now I'm going to do it as, as opposed to I'm the investor model of like, who is solving this problem and, and how can I support them? No. And that's, that's right. That's why humility is something you learn what you're good at and then you accept what you're not good at, and then you partner with people who are good at all the other things that need to be done. And so we're good at organizing and scaling and doing these things and, and having some money to help them along the way. 
And we've done it. I mean, this is for our work in criminal justice reform. You look at who we've partnered with, Van Jones. He led uh, a demonstration against one of our first events. And now he's partnering with us on that. And, and we think other things. And, and then we've, then we've, uh, we've partnered from everybody from the ACLU to the American Conservative Union on this and changed the country's perspective on lock them up and throw away the key to let's empower them. Let's get, let's show them that they can contribute and that they will be better off and, and use prison time not to make them bigger, more bitter criminals and ha who have no other choice when they get out but to be a criminal, but teach them a skill and how to contribute the values and skills of success. And, and like, like Sean Pika, who's, who's founded an or who was in prison at age 16 for murder and life imprisonment, he started helping the other prisoners and now they, 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 he has courses there. And rather than the normal recidivism rate of like uh, 50, 60 percent, his is like 2 percent. I mean, get the difference <laughs> from empowering people rather than controlling them and limiting and stifling them. And Ryan, I think through these examples, you can tell, like, we believe the, the way forward and the better way is building these coalitions. And we may disagree on a number of issues, right? But getting past that, having an open mindset and be, being willing to work with anyone to do right, criminal justice is a great example of that. But can we apply that to immigration? Can we apply that to, you know, um, cracking the the intractable problem of poverty with new solutions, right? Overcoming violence, overcoming addiction. We're applying that same model across everything. And our message to everyone is we're willing to work with anyone. Anyone that has an innovative idea, let's, uh, let's roll up our sleeves and figure out what we can do. I wanted to go back to this idea of money for a second, because there's a sort of a, a, an interesting philosophical tension in stoicism that, that maybe you could help shed some light on. Uh, so Seneca is the richest man in Rome, uh, other than Nero. And there's this sort of knock on him as, as that it's somehow, you know, uh, hypocritical for a philosopher to be rich. Uh, there's another great joke from Musonius Rufus. Um, there's this, there was this super obnoxious sort of unethical man in Rome and uh, everyone was complaining about him, uh, was, was upset. And so Musonius uh, orders him to be given a large amount of money. And somebody said, well, how could you, how could you do this? He's a, he's a horrible person. And he says, um, ah, yes, but isn't money exactly what this man deserves? Being that, that the large fortune would be a punishment on this person because he wouldn't know how to use it. How has, as someone who loves books, loves ideas, loves, you know, as you said, doing right, uh, how, how has your, your fortune, there's really no other word for it, how is, how is wealth and fortune uh, tested some of these ideas? How, how have you, how have you, in, you know, integrated that in your life. I imagine it must, to a certain extent, be surreal. No, no, it's, uh, I mean, having the fortune and, and constantly testing what we're doing and through trial and error, are we really empowering people? Are we moving us toward our North Star of equal rights and mutual benefit? Or are we not? And we make mistakes. But it, it gives us the ability to do that and to help many more people, uh, not by, by what we think helps them, but by seeing they're transforming their lives. This helps them transform their lives. So, I mean, I mean, that's what we want. We want people who are helping people live better lives and having a better society that empowers more people, gives more people opportunity we want them to be successful and have resources. Who do you want to have resources? People use them for that or ill or to get power over people and stifle people and enslave them. So, I mean, to me, it's not whether somebody has money. It's, it's, it goes back to this thing. How do people become successful? Is it by empowering people or is it by controlling and limiting and trying to rig the system? 
Yeah, that, that was Seneca's line. He said, uh, you know, a philosopher can be rich provided that his money is not stained in blood. And so I think that's that's the idea, too. What what did 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 your success come from good principles from creating value or, or does your does your fortune come from extraction and and uh, sort of seeing the world as a zero sum place? Yeah, no. And see, and, and consistent with that. My philosophy is the end unjustified the means. The means become the end. For example, we, can, we can't use, to be successful in transforming society, we can't use the means of a Lenin or a Hitler. We have to use means consistent with our ends. Otherwise, we will not end up with the, the kind of society we're advocating. Yeah, it makes a mockery of the of the ends if the means are a contradiction of them. Absolutely. Yeah, and undermine and you will never get there, as we see in all these countries who have these the the destructive means, then the end is destructive. Ryan, I think this also ties to uh, Joseph Schumpeter's principle of creative destruction. And how we apply it back in your, um, you know, how do you grow your business to be successful and do it in the right way? Um, creative destruction, which is basically the idea that uh, the way you've done business in the past, you have to creatively destroy that or, or the market will. So you have to be uh, drawing new curves in your business um, all the time. And that's uh, Coke Industries core vision, apply creative destruction and come up with products and services that are better than customers alternatives while always consuming fewer resources. So any product we make, uh, you know, Georgia Pacific toilet paper, for example, we've got to make that in a more environmentally friendly way all the time, use less water, make it more efficient. So when a consumer walks down the aisle and they have a, a choice, they're saying, I want that one because it has the lowest environmental footprint and has the best features and benefits. I know it's kind of ironic I'm using toilet paper, but we make a lot of that stuff, right? And uh, so if you have that mindset of continuing to drive creative destruction, then your products and services will be best in the market and you're consuming the fewest resources possible. Back to your extraction question. Right. You know, it's like you're, you're continuing to improve that every day. And that, that's, the, that's the way we do business. And, and to go to this idea of, of, of me, uh, ends and means, from what I understand of your lifestyle, from what I've read about you, you don't seem like someone who was particularly motivated by a particular end. You seem like you genuinely love the process, whether it's like you love uh, the idea, both of you, the idea of making the process more efficient or the idea of building a slightly better culture. The idea is the idea when you talked about, you know, sort of making things more efficient, you know, better principles. It's not to get Coke Industries to a certain level or to make a certain amount of money, it's that you you love the craft of the machine and 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 you've dedicated your life to it. Well, I mean, what I what I love is the feeling. What turns me on the most when I see, I mean, it's about not about me, it's about these ideas. And and when I see people turn these ideas into personal knowledge and start living by them and it transform their lives. That's the most thrilling thing to me. And having Coke Industries and, and stand together, uh, uh, do all this and seeing what they do to help improve people's lives, that's it. And I just, what I want it to spread more and more so more and more people can benefit from these principles. And so that's what turns me on. And, and so, sure, we want Coke Industries to be profitable so we can continue to do it. And we can show that dedicating yourself to, 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 to contributing to others and succeeding by that is the way to go rather than by rigging the system or hurting others. Yeah, a friend, a friend of mine, the, the, the videographer Casey Neistat, he was saying, um, you know, we don't do the work to make money. We make the money to do more good work. That's, that's uh, and, great. And, and, I love and that it. it's, it's the loop. He's like, because if we were just doing this to make money, we'd all, he, he was saying, I just, I just direct TV commercials. You know, like you just do whatever the most lucrative form right. of whatever your craft is. The point is you're making the money, you're, you're building the business so you can do work you actually like to do. Absolutely. That's fulfilling. 
that makes you believe in yourself. Yeah. Because that's a, I mean, let's, let's face it. We, we, our book is Believe in People, but believing in people starts with believing in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, I, I mean, this is a very much the stoic philosophy. If you don't believe in yourself, how can you believe in anybody else? So you need to work on that first and not by phony stuff, just, oh, you're wonderful and stuff. No, you're a bum. <laughs> you're you're a louse. You're you're doing bad things. So shape up. I mean, I talk, this we need to do that to ourselves. I need to be better. I need to do, every day work at getting better. Well, what I say is, um, uh, if you don't believe you can do something, you're probably you know going to be ab- unable to do it. But just because you believe you can do something doesn't mean that you can do it. So you you, you, you you have to find something to be confident of in yourself. And that has to be based in the evidence and the reading you've done, the work you've done, the relationships you've built, the product you make, whatever that, that is. So how uh, on uh, uh, your your uh, your audience, your your fans, uh how can this any of these help them? I mean, would 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 they like to? I mean, what what are what are their uh, passions? What are they? What injustices do they see? What what experience do they have that they can help improve things and empower people? And I mean, I mean, you'd love to see everybody get engaged in that in 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 any of the four sets of institutions, whatever fits their ability, their experiences and their passions. Yeah, it's interesting in in meditations of Marcus Aurelius, he uses the phrase the common good more than 80 times. Uh, I don't think that he means that in the communistic sense. I think what he means is that the Epicureans as philosophers turn inward. You know, they retreat to the garden and they, they study about, you know, they focus on their ideas and, and they, they think that happiness is in the sort of the intellectual and the spiritual pursuit. And I think there's something true about that. You, you go on a meditation retreat, you become a monk, whatever it is, there, there's something fulfilling about that. But what I find so inspiring about the Stoics is the belief that, no, we have to contribute. We have to contribute politically, uh, civically, uh, from a business perspective. You have to, you know, start and raise a family. You, you have to, you have to do something. And so I think, I think when I hear from the audience, and I'd be curious for your advice on this. I think what people are struggling with is they go, things are obviously bad, right? Things are falling apart politically. Uh, you know, we've got environmental issues. The world looks like it's going through all these sort of different fits and spasms. I think people. Some, some, they, they despair at the magnitude of the problems facing us. And, and perhaps the reason they despair is that they're thinking about it top down. Like, what can I magically do to solve this? What advice do you have for someone ab- about making a difference at a sort of a small individual level? No, that's, that's a great question. And Maslow, I think, had a great answer for it. He said, he said, that's the problem today. There's so many people who who see that things aren't right, many things aren't right, and they may have a vision of a better state, but they need a path to get there. And he said, and the, and the problem with so many is they say, God, I'm only one person. What can I do? He said, that's all there is. We're all only one person, and the way we can make a difference is join with others who we share vision and values. And that's what Stand Together is. It's, it's a collection of th- thousands or tens of thousands of people who are worked, working together and they're not working all on the same issue. One, one group is really passionate about criminal justice reform. And others are reforming education to empower people rather than a one size fits all teach to test. Uh, others are 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 want to get business to be more long term focused. Focus on creating, succeeding by creating value for others. So we have different ones who focus on that, and and that's the opportunity. And join, and that's what Stand Together provides, is the opportunity to join with others, and focus on what you're passionate about. 
Hey, Ryan, one example of this that may bring this to life in terms of how we're really trying to innovate around this question and and bring more and more folks into this model that my father described is, you know, I, I was always really passionate about music and um, always thought I was like, God, we have no, um, no element or no variable of music in Stand Together. And I believe, at least for me, music is, there's nothing more powerful as a uniter of people than music. Sure. You, can be, you can disagree, uh, you're in a concert, you disagree with, with, with you know, 90% of the folks, but you're all there lined up around music and on the same wavelength, right? So I, I thought to myself, how can we take this idea and combine it with with the power of Stand Together's ideas in this community that's been built. So during COVID, um, re- launched a, a kind of a virtual Stand Together, Jam Together tour with a number of musicians that we didn't really have relationships with before, but they looked at it and said, wow, you guys really have capability that are getting real results. And it's not something where, you know, I get asked to do a, uh, a, a one-off concert for a benefit deal, and then it's one and done, and I I have no idea where that money went. Sure. Right. So now what we're doing is partnering with um, this community of artists that are excited about one of these issues. I talked about addiction before. Right. So um, Matt Sorum from Guns N' Roses is part of our group. And uh, he's been on some of our stand together, jam together um, virtual shows. And he's he sees it as well. This is a platform like I I struggle with addiction. I'm 13 years sober, but I have a voice. Kids like love Guns N' Roses, right? They like the music side and they'll 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 listen to this. I have a new platform for my voice to get out there, but also align with something like the Phoenix, a real concrete organization that is getting real results. And so we're, we're now doing that. These are unlikely collaborations, like what we talked about before. We weren't doing this a year ago. So how does this open up a whole new world of unlikely collaborations and coalitions, to my father's point, to, um, uh, to, to just really open this thing up and blow the top off and get these ideas out there with bottom-up solutions and working with anyone to do right? It's working. I mean, we're just scratching the surface, but more and more artists are now coming to us saying, I see what you've done with this artist or that artist, and we think there's tremendous potential there. Yeah, there's a, a joke I, I heard they were talking about um, – uh, you know, sort of despairing, you know, the, the, the great man of history theory, you know, the idea that, that people are now sort of down on this, the idea that an individual can't make a difference. And the joke is, uh, you know, you think an individual can't change the world. Talk to the person who ate a bat in 2019, right? Like some, somebody, <laughs> so a single person it changed the entire scope yeah. of the world. And, and so, you know, if it can be done negatively, of course it can also be done positively. I think about, I've been, I, I'm writing about this in my next book, the guy who, who, who starts the ice bucket challenge, which has had, you know, a bigger impact on, on, on the, the, the race to find a cure for ALS than any person in history. It's just some guy who starts an internet video, right? And, and, and that an in individual can make a difference. I think the stoic thing is like, you don't know if it's going to work, but you try and you try and you try and you try. And eventually, you know, it does happen. Some, something happens. It might not be you, but you're part of a tradition of people trying and something sticks. So, so Ryan, the way we think about it to get more people in, engaged and asking, you know, your audience as well is what's that issue that they care about, that they're passionate, that they see an injustice in. Mm-hmm. And then, um, how can we partner with them to expose them to a broader coalition and then have all these unlikely collaborations to really get synergy behind it? And three, making sure that everyone involved has the courage to act, right? And it's, that's what you said before. It's like, it's easy to say like, wow, there's all these problems, but not doing the experiment around the ice bucket challenge. Right. right. It's, e- it's e- easy to say, oh, I'm just going to go through, go through the motions and, and do what I do every day instead of thinking differently. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to jump in and experiment and try something new that can transform my life, but also transform many others lives at the same time. Yeah, it's funny. Like if, if it was a business idea you had, you'd start networking, you'd ask around, you'd look for investors, right. you'd look for collaborators. But then when you see a problem in the world, you do tend to default towards the the model of the top-down solution. What can I do individually as a mandate that solves this? And if, if we were a bit more entrepreneurial about it, as you're talking about, it would unlock, you know, a lot more solutions and, and 
you know, creative energy that otherwise sits, you know, unused. Yeah, so you look at look at, uh, at the change in, in criminal justice system. I mean, it's not perfect, but particularly in certain states, they've made a big difference and changed the, the, the general paradigm about what should be done. I mean, we got a long way to go to 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 uh, to deal with with all the problems, uh, but 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 that started that same way. That is, uh, we 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 got together, changed paradigms, and and then it spread as people saw it work better, and that's what we're doing with all of these. Is like we, we have in to deal with communities, we have partnerships with like 200 social entrepreneurs and each one is showing a better way. And as that spreads, then it gets in the, the culture. It changes the culture. It changes the, 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 the national paradigm. And then it starts to change. And you look at all the successful social movements in this country, that's the way they started, whether that was abolitionist, whether that was women's rights, whether that was civil rights, gay rights, all of them started that way. There was no momentum for it until a few people got together and had the courage to act. And look at Frederick Douglass. He was a slave. And look what he accomplished, because he had the courage to act, and he was also contribution motivated. Even when he was a slave, he, he got a chance to teach, to teach Sunday school, and he started teaching them the other slaves to read. And he says, at last, I found a way to contribute. He was a slave, tortured, but he wanted to contribute. It's... Uh... Yeah, the, the, the frustrating thing about America is that change happens very, very slowly and then very, very quickly. So all these movements that you mentioned, there were years and years of no progress and no progress and no progress. And then like that, it can all change. And so I think it's very easy to get depressed, to tell yourself it's broken and nothing's working, but you don't, you, you don't know that actually three years from now, it's going to be, you're, we're going to make 30 years of progress. And, and that, that, is, that is something I was going to ask you about. Maybe it's a good place to sort of wind down, which is, you know, the premise of the book, believe in people. And I, I, when I blurb it, I, I, I totally agree with the premise. But I think one of the interesting tensions in stoicism is, and I think all of philosophy, the more you study human nature, the more you study history, it's easy to become jaded and cynical and a bit depressed. How, and, and I think the last year has been a little bit of that for me. How do you believe in people uh, when, when people are, uh, are showing you in some ways uh, uh, maybe that they shouldn't be believed in, right? Like, how do, how do, you, how do you retain that optimism in human potential in, in that change is coming when, you know, when we just spent the last 12 months with people, you know, struggling to do, to take even the most basic health precautions for the sake of their neighbors. Right. No, no. And, and everybody isn't going to be on the right track and we're never going to have a utopia, but we don't need that. All we need is a significant portion of the population who, who, who believes and practices uh, these principles. And, uh, and, and, and what that takes is an individual uh, uh, really committing themselves to it and practicing it in, in a way that reaches others. So, I mean, that's the, that's the key to, to social change. And we see that everywhere through the people we work with. And so this is the encouraging thing to us. We see uh, people who've across the whole ideological spectrum, where you just peak, including all the people who've endorsed our book is to yourself, and you looked at the spectrum of them, and they believe in this. They see this is a better way. And so the first thing is to, is to see that the hatred that both sides are showing is not productive, it's counterproductive. We have to find a way 
that we will get people to, to, to focus on helping each other and succeeding by that rather than hurting. So we got to show them a better way. And until we do that, until we empower people from the bottom up and show them a better way, they're going to double down on the old way because that's all they know. So that's our secret is to, is to scale, get these ideas out, but not with theory, just with theory, but, and with principles, what I like to talk about, but with real live examples, how it's changed lives and how, how Van Jones can lead the demonstration and hate us and then start working with us. And now he calls our, our main guy working like a brother and he loves what we're doing. And that's and that we're saying to them, you have respect. And then you start finding new ways to work together. And then the other people aren't total evil who need to be destroyed. They're people who haven't been shown a better way. And that's the only thing. And that's what has happened throughout history. Every time societies have improved, it's been through that mechanism. Yeah, it's funny, Marcus opens meditations, he says, you know, the people you will meet today are jealous and stupid and angry and mean and frustrating. He lists all the things. And so you think you know where this is going, right? And, and there's a certain sort of philosophical value in just anticipating how unpleasant things are going to be. But then he says, they are only like this because they don't know good from evil. And he said, they're the same as me and they're made from the same thing as me. And he says, right. and no, and, and I won't let them implicate me in ugliness. And I think that's, that's sort of what I've tried to remind myself because as a writer, you hear from some, you, you hear from fans and you also hear from people who are definitely not fans and you have to go, okay, that's them. They're this way for whatever reason, I'm going to keep doing what I think is right. And I'm going to try to connect with as many people who are on that same page as me to do as much right as we can together. No, that's it. That's well, and Ryan, that's what it. I would say is I, I wanted to thank you for everything that you do to take these ideas and present them in a very in innovative way to your audience. And I'm one of those folks in your audience that's, you. a fan, that's a fan. And, and uh, you know, I've called you the modern day Maslow before. And I truly believe that because if they're just ideas and you can't help people turn them into action to really improve their lives and then help other people improve their lives, then it's, it, it is not a lot of value there. But you have a very creative way of doing that. And the more people that you can reach, and I think that's what my father has been trying to do, turn ideas into action, whether it's in business with market-based management, how we do business, or how we believe in people through our philanthropy efforts and how we, we build coalitions. It's very, very similar. And if we can get more folks to internalize these ideas and then act with courage, you can spark movements to, to change the trajectory of the country and overcome some of these huge problems that we've been talking about. So a big thank you to you for, for your leadership in that. Yeah, and just, to, just to add to that, I mean, in a key is persistence because to changing your, your uh, paradigm means changing your mental models, changing uh, the way your, your brain functions because you have these mental habits. So your brain is wired to, to reinforce and protect those and be defensive about those. So the only way we change that, it's like when we change our body. If you're a weightlifter and you want to be a marathoner, it's not instant pudding. You've got to work intensely over time to change your body. Well, your brain and your mental habits are the same. It takes work effort over time. And so you have persistence, you're on it every day, reminding people. And after a while, then that seeps in. And that's what we have found here. I mean, we at first said, as we really got into our, our framework, we can, uh, well, we'll make this acquisition and we can change the culture and everything in a few months and everything will be good to go. No, we find it takes years with an acquisition. So as you pointed out, to change the culture in the country to be more loving and helping rather than hurting, this is an instant pudding. And so we have to have persistence and patience and work every day at it. Yeah, uh, Zeno says, uh, well-being is realized by small steps, but it's no small thing. 
And I think it's about that sort of day to dayness of it. That's it, exactly. All right. So last last version of this question then for you, and and then we should wrap up. But um, so you, you know, you employ hundreds of thousands of people. I imagine you know millions of people have been through your organizations over the years. You've met all these different people through your nonprofit works. You've traveled all over the world. You you have your fingers in every possible industry you could imagine. You have this idea. You believe in people. What is it fundamentally that keeps you believing in people? What gives you hope that things can get better? What, what is that core thing that you believe in inside people? It's that, it's that when, when people believe in themselves, when they find a gift, their gift, and, and, uh, and they can u- develop that and use that to contribute and succeed, then they believe in themselves. And once they believe in themselves and, and, su- and, and see they succeed by helping others succeed, that transforms them. And we've seen that over and over. For example, my wife and I started this program in, in one classroom in a, in a tough part of town in Wichita called, called, uh, Prince, uh, called uh, Youth Entrepreneurs. And, and, and so it's, it's not just cl- class, teach them, it's to get them to, to build a bu- create a business plan, start their own business, and you give them some seed capital and help them find what they're good at. And it's once they succeed at that and find they can and have somebody else who believes in them and helps them and mentors them, they're transformed from being throwaway kids, as they're called, or no good kids, to being productive. And a lot of them now are very successful entrepreneurs or have gone on to college and had very successful lives. It's transformative. That's what I see. So because somebody's bad or made a mistake, they're not throwaway kids. They're not, you, you believe in them and help them believe in themselves and you can tr- help them transform themselves. So it sounds like what you really believe in ultimately is, is not just people. What you believe in is, is potential. You believe in human potential. Absolutely. I love it. Guys, this was so great. I'm really glad we did this. I can't wait to see you both in person again. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having us.